Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. In many respects, meditation practice could be understood as a science of the mind. The Buddha taught the liberating insights of the Four Noble Truths and how mindfulness is the basic methodology for investigating these truths. When we hear and study and read the teachings, I can really begin to appreciate the amazing clarity and precision with which the Buddha uh, unpacked or described how suffering is created in our minds and our lives and the possibility of freedom. But meditation is an art as well as a science. And tonight I'd like to speak about one particular quality of mind that more than any other (coughs) requires this artistic sensibility. It's a quality of mind that appears more frequently than any other in the various lists of the qualities of awakening, the principles of enlightenment. And the Buddha spoke of this quality as being that particular aspect of the mind that makes possible the fulfillment of all our aspirations. It's a very powerful force within us that needs a very delicate touch. So the word in Pali for this particular state of mind or quality of mind (coughs) is virya. And we can get a sense of its meaning and the complexity of its meaning when we consider the various ways this Pali word virya has been translated into English. So it's sometimes translated as strength or as courage or as vigor of vitality, of perseverance, of effort. So just try to imagine, put all of these meanings together, you know, and we'll get some sense of what uh, the Buddha is talking about when when he talks of virya, strength and courage and vigor and vitality and perseverance and persistence and effort all together. It's this, it's this enlightenment factor. In its most basic meaning, virya refers to energy, which is the capacity for activity. It's the capacity, it's what enables us uh, to be engaged. It enables us to do things, to accomplish things. So the art of meditation is learning how to cultivate this quality of virya and how to modulate it and to use it in appropriate ways. So we can experience it and we can explore its meaning, this energetic capacity of mind in many different ways. We can feel it as a kind of strength of mind that holds up or supports wholesome uh, aspects of our minds. And the Buddha used this this metaphor of uh, virya as being a post or a support. It's like uh, a post or a beam of wood that's supporting a building, you know, that may be falling down. And so we brace it and we support it. So it's virya which supports 
all the wholesome states of mind uh, that we may have cultivated. So that these skillful and beautiful states of mind don't decrease. And the Buddha emphasized the importance of this in one very um, simple but really far-reaching statement. He said that when we practice, wisdom grows. And when we don't practice, wisdom wanes or decreases. So this is, this is an important lesson for us, that wisdom is not something we get and then that we have, you know, that we hold on to for safekeeping. If the wisdom is not continually nurtured and cultivated through our practice, it becomes a memory. You know, we have a memory of an insight or a memory of understanding and it's not particularly alive within us. And when it's not, then it's very easy for old habit patterns uh, to emerge, to re-emerge. There was a 12th century Korean Zen master, I think he was maybe one of the founders of Korean Zen, his name was Shinul. And there's a wonderful book of his teachings uh, called Tracing Back the Radiance. He had, he had a framework for all of his teachings, which he called Sudden Awakening, Gradual Cultivation. Right. So he pointed to the possibility of really suddenly awakening to the free aspect of our minds, the liberated aspect. But he emphasized that that moment of sudden awakening is not enough. It needs a gradual cultivation. So this is what he said, and I think that you'll be able to relate to this. <clears throat> Beginningless habit energies are extremely difficult to remove, to remove suddenly. Hindrances are formidable, and habits are deeply ingrained. I love that line. Hindrances are formidable. They are, and we see, you know, even with all of our practice and all of our insight, the hindrances, they have tremendous power. And so it takes the gradual cultivation. And the gradual cultivation of wisdom requires energy, requires virya. It's precisely this factor a virya that keeps the wisdom growing, that keeps the wholesome states that are within us, you know, the mindfulness and the interest and the investigation and the calm and the concentration and all the other factors of enlightenment. It's virya which supports it, virya which sustains it. And it's virya, this, this faculty of energy, that is particularly important, not only, not only for sustaining the wholesome states that are within us, but for arousing the energy to really investigate during times of difficulty. You know, when we feel submerged in difficult mind states or emotions, Can we arouse the energy to really look to see, okay, what is going on here? You know, what can I understand in this difficulty, in this hindrance? So this highlights another aspect of virya, which mm, I find tremendously uh, inspiring. That is in times of difficulty, in times of suffering, when we're really uh, caught up in some difficult life experiences or difficult emotions or difficult mind states. The quality of virya that keeps us engaged in a vital way 
is virya in its aspect or manifestation uh, of courage. The word courage comes from the Latin word for heart. And so we might understand courage as strength of heart. You know, the, the willingness to be with whatever arises. We can experience this uh, very directly and understand um, the power of it when we look more closely uh, at the experience of sloth and torpor. You know, we're all familiar with times of sleepiness or dullness in our practice. So that's just, you know, a common part of a meditator's experience. But sloth and torpor actually has a deeper meaning than, you know, intermittent bouts of sleepiness. On a deeper level, sloth and torpor refers to the very deeply ingrained habit pattern of retreating from difficulties. That's really what sloth and torpor, the the function of sloth and torpor. In the face of difficulty, instead of going forward to meet it, it retreats. It withdraws from difficulty. So we can see this a lot in our practice. You know, as we go through difficult times, it would be interesting to observe what's the first response of the mind. Is it to meet it? with virya, with courage? Is it kind of to pull back from it, to retreat, to avoid, which is the manifestation of sloth and torpor? It can get very tricky because sloth and torpor in our practice and in our lives often comes masquerading as compassion. You know, we might be feeling a little tired or a little bored, or a little restless. And instead of engaging with and being interested in these states, really coming to understand them, we might hear this very kindly voice in the mind. Let me take care of myself. A little nap will be just the thing, you know, and Yes, self-care is important. and So we pull back, we retreat. Right? So it's sloth and torpor in the guise of compassion. Of course, there are times when we actually do need rest. So this is where meditation is an art. We really have to be very aware and very sensitive. You know, when is this pulling back? just sloth and torpor. When is the pulling back appropriate? Because we do need some rest or we do need some ease. So the art of the practice is bringing this wise discernment to the practice. What is appropriate? And we learn from just trying out different things. You know, we shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes because it's through the mistakes that we make that we actually learn something. So I'll just give one example of the possibility of working with a difficult situation and the possibility of meeting it with virya rather than with sloth and torpor, rather than with that retreating aspect of mind. So this goes back to my India days back in the, uh, around 1970. And it was when I was first doing retreats with Goenkaji, you know, one of the well-known Vipassana teachers. And his schedule during those, there were 10 day retreats, uh, we would get up at four in the morning and there'd be a two hour sit before breakfast. So in that, in that particular style of practice, there's not a lot of walking. There's much more emphasis on sitting. So I'd get up 
And I would actually be inspired to get up quickly so I could get to the meditation hall and find the space against the wall. You know? so, so I didn't have a problem getting up. <laughs> and I found my space, you know, 4.10 in the morning. And I'd be doing the practice, and then after about 15 minutes, you know, I'd just lean back against the wall. <laughs> and before long, I'd be asleep. And this happened every day. You know, I'd get up, get to the hall, sit down, lean against the wall, fall asleep. So after four or five days of this, I thought, this is stupid. <laughs> you know, why don't I just sleep till breakfast? <laughs> And then at least when I get up, I'll be alert and I'll be awake. That's that voice. <laughs> Watch out for the voice. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't listen to it. I just kept on getting up, going to the hall, and it was quite amazing. And I can't remember now exactly how long it took and whether it was in that first retreat or maybe a second or third one. But at a certain point, <clears throat> I got up, I went to the hall and I was awake the whole time. If I had retreated from that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have worked through it. You know, and so there's, there's one little aphorism which I think often applies in meditation. The way out is through. Right? It's like we need to go through the difficulties in a balanced way. You know? And that's when we begin to expand our energetic possibilities. You know, we're also retreating from difficulties at those times when we may feel annoyed or irritated by something. And instead of arousing the virya, the energy, to really look at the difficulty and to look at our own minds, we immediately rush to try to fix the situation. And in a retreat environment, during intensive practice, this often takes the form of what we call yogi mind. And yogi mind is a meditative syndrome <laughs> for which there are few known remedies. <laughs> where because of the, the way we practice and the development of more concentration, everything gets, uh, we might say, enhanced or enlarged, including, here's a word I'm not sure, even if it's English, and whether those of you not from America will know what it means, but it often enlarges or enhances our cockamamie ideas about things <laughs> are crazy ideas. So just as an example, this, this is an example that goes way back to the early days of teaching. We're teaching in some retreat, wasn't here. And the retreat just happened to be in a place where, um, you know, it was under the fl uh, flight path of, of some airplanes. And they weren't, they weren't flying low, they were just up in the sky, but you, you could hear them. And we get this one note from a yogi who was disturbed by the sound, who was not looking at this disturbance in his mind. So the note said, can you please write to the airlines <laughs> so that they change the flight path? <laughs> And it's like, this, this person was serious. <laughs> that is yogi mind. So with sloth and topa, with this retreating from difficulties, e either in the case, you know, of whether we uh, pull back in times of sleepiness and dullness instead of just exploring and going through, or with difficult mind states, we immediately try to fix it rather than actually look at our own minds. The nature of virya is exactly the opposite of sloth and torpor. Virya meets the challenge, 
virya goes right into the difficulty so that we can begin to understand it. The quality of virya, of courage, is that it is challenged by difficulties. It almost welcomes difficulties. It arouses that uh, quality of energy within us. Oh, there's a difficulty here. Let me engage. Let me understand. Can I be with this? Can I understand it? The quality of virya is actually inspired by difficult tasks. And I think you can get a sense, <clears throat> you know, at different times in your own experience where, yeah, we, we take it as a challenge. Let, let me take this on. This is something I can do. I had to just one little example of this. This is just a daily life example. But it really showed me this potential of the mind, the heart, that actually seeks to engage with difficulties. And this is quite a few years ago, uh, when I was kind of just beginning a little bit of mountain biking. And there's a lot of great mountain biking trails around here. But I would be going with friends who were much, much better than I was, you know, and so they'd be going up the hills and for a long time, I'd make it halfway up and then have to walk the bike up. I just didn't have the, the strength to do it. And they'd be waiting at the top, reading War and Peace. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept on, you know, I kept on biking and just doing it. And of course, the more one does in anything, you know, we get stronger in our ability to do it. And I remember the point, and it was a very striking, it was a very striking moment when I felt enough you know, confidence or strength or energy that I actually started looking for hills to go up. It's like I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to see, rather than kind of holding back and dreading it. So this is that quality. This is that quality of virya. So we meet different challenges for the sake of accomplishing what it is that we value, whether it's what we value in meditation practice, what we value in our lives. And it's really helpful to remember, as we're engaged in this whole process, that virya, like every other factor, gets stronger through practice. It's not that, you know, we all start with this amazing quality of energy, but rather as we practice, this ability, you know, this energy, this courage to meet difficulties, it gets stronger. We become more confident in it. So perhaps the most mm, dramatic statement of virya is... One statement of the Bodhisattva in his quest for Buddhahood is a very famous uh, <clears throat> quotation from the texts where the Bodhisattva said, Let only my skin and bones remain. Let my blood dry up. I will not give up until I have accomplished what can be done by human effort and endeavor. So that's, that's planting the flag. You know. I will not give up until I have accomplished what can be done by human effort and endeavor. Now of interest here is that freedom or peace or awakening is not linked to some super normal, supernatural power that bestows upon it, it upon us. The Buddha is linking it directly to our humanness. What can be accomplished by our human effort, our human endeavor. You know, and has been said very often 
The Buddha only points the way, but we have to do the work ourselves. We need to walk the path ourselves. But even so, we may hear this and think, yes, that kind of courageous declaration, that's okay for the bodhisattva, but it may feel very far away from what we're capable of. And it's true that we may not yet be at the level of the bodhisattva's courage and energy and dedication. But still, there are many examples of people who are manifesting this quality of virya in just their ordinary lives. And it can happen in very individual ways. And I just want to share with you one story of an example of virya. And it actually has to do with someone who is on staff here at IMS. Uh, his name is Charles Stevenson, who's the, man, the IT manager. He's kind of a computer genius. So before he came to IMS, he's been here quite a few years now, but in his pre-IMS life, so this a number of years ago, uh, he was in the army. And he told me this story while he was in the army. He volunteered, they had some kind of event And he volunteered, along with others, to run a marathon, 26 miles, with a 35-pound pack on his back. So this is the army. (laughs) And he, he just wanted to do it. So he's telling me this story, and it seemed like just about the farthest thing in the world from something I'd want to do. (laughs) <laughs> so, so I was I was really interested and curious, you know. So I was asking, you know, why on earth did you? This was this was voluntary. He volunteered to do this. So I said, what you know, what motivated you to do this? And he said he was just interested in exploring his mind in this kind of extreme circumstance. It was kind of a test. He wanted to go to the edge of his comfort zone and just say, what's going to happen? You know, so he had that kind of interest uh, and inspiration. And he said that at mile 13, there were a lot of those very seductive thoughts. You know, oh, maybe this is enough, maybe I should rest. Maybe. And there were cars there taking people who were running it back to rest area you know, for those who wanted to stop the race at that time. But he continued, you know, he got through that, you know, time of seductive thought. And he said, for those runners who continued, that there was a whole change in the quality of the race, that they actually, it felt like they were giving each other mutual support. And it reminded me really of what happens on retreat, you know, and the power of Sangha of how we actually support ourselves and support each other, you know, in this endeavor, which in some way is more challenging than running a marathon with a 35 pound pack, you know? So this, this is an amazing endeavor you're engaged in and hanging in there with it, we give each other a lot of support. So he finished. And as he told me the story, I thought, this is a great example of this mental quality of virya, the different aspects. You know, it was virya that energized his initial interest and motivation. It was virya as strength, you know, that kept him going. It was virya as courage that allowed him to meet the difficulties, you know, the challenges along the way. And to me, what was most remarkable is that he volunteered to do the race again the next year. (laughs) He has a virya down. (laughs) 
This does not mean, and I am not suggesting, that we should all go out and run this kind of marathon. That is not the point. But we need to consider for ourselves, what is it that we really value in our lives? What do we value about our Dharma practice? And realize that to accomplish what we value, this quality of virya is indispensable. And, and the Buddha was just pointing this out again and again and again. It gives us the strength. It gives us the courage. It gives us the determination. That's what enables us to do it. Now, in all these situations, it doesn't mean that as we go through challenging circumstances that we do it necessarily without any doubt and without any fear. No, those are part of the challenges as well. These are the, as Chanel said, the hindrances are formidable. So these mind states are going to come up. It's virya which helps us to get through them. Uh, you, you're familiar with the uh, American artist Georgia O'Keeffe? She was a great artist. She, she did a lot of painting in the Southwest and uh, desert. Uh, she had an amazing life. She said, I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life, and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. You know, so to me, that's just, yes, that's virya. That's, that's a sense of courage. It doesn't mean that we can only act when we're free of fear or free of hesitation or free of doubt. I've never let it stop me from doing a single thing I've wanted to do. So that's the quality that we need to understand, to connect with, to cultivate in our Dharma practice. Now we can also see this quality of virya, courageous energy in the lives of many people who are in the very front lines of engaged social action, which can often be very challenging situations. You know, I've just recently, I've been reading some history of the civil rights movement in this country. And so reading the stories of people like Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, John Lewis, and then you know, reading about Mandela in South Africa, and, people who are right there at the edge. And somehow they have this amazing capacity, this amazing courageous heart that can keep the heart open in the face of tremendous hatred and violence. So what is it? Th that's this quality of virya, of courage, of strength, of perseverance. Reading about examples like this, it really inspires me because, you know, it points to the possibility and kind of encourages the possibility that we also, in our own way and in our own arenas and in areas of our own interest, we can also extend our comfort zone. You know, we can, we can practice playing at the edge sometimes when things may be difficult or may be uncomfortable, but it's virya which inspires us to explore that. And of course, this plays a critical role in our whole dharma unfolding. So in addition to strength and courage and energy, Virya also manifests as perseverance and persistence. So courage gives us the strength to face the difficulties and perseverance keeps us going through them. So I'll just give a couple of examples of this. 
There's a very famous story of the Tibetan uh, master, Master Yogi Milarepa, you know, who had gone off and lived in caves and just lived on nettle greens and, and attained this amazing level of realization and awakening. And then he spent the rest of his life teaching. And at the end of his life, he wanted to give the transmission to his chief disciple, whose name was Gampopa. So he takes Gampopa off into the countryside and he's going to, you know, pass on the secret teachings. And they get all said and, you know, make all the preparations. And Gampopa is very anxiously awaiting this transmission. And as the story goes, Milarepa turned around, lifted his robe, and pointed to the calluses on his butt. (laughs) That was the transmission. (laughs) You know, it's the the hours, the endless hours that he spent in meditation. That's what made possible his great realization, his great awakening. You know, so we shouldn't we shouldn't overlook. You know, sometimes we think, oh, if only I get the secret teachings. That's the secret teaching. <laughs> <laughs> and just in a you know much more modest way, I, I had a, a similar internal kind of sense of this. I remember, I was in India at the time practicing. And I was just going through a very uh, dry period. You know, it was just nothing much was happening. And the mind was discouraged. And I'm sure you're familiar with times like that. And I could feel myself, you know, I could feel myself falling into discouragement. But then I kind of gave myself a talking to. You know, and I said, Joseph, just sit and walk. Sit and walk, sit and walk. That's your job, speaking to myself. You know, that's my job. My job is to sit and walk, surrender to the Dharma. Let the Dharma unfold just as it does. I'm not in control of how it unfolds. I just have to do my part. And it was amazing, just that very simple reminder Okay, what can I do? I can keep the practice going. I'll just sit and I'll walk and I'll sit and I'll walk and I'll sit and I'll walk. And at a certain point, the energy built up and the practice again you know, felt juicy, felt rich. So we need, we need to understand virya as this quality of perseverance as well. We just keep going. Now, as we explore this quality, which is one of the factors of enlightenment, it's also important to remember that virya itself is ethically neutral. It can be used for wholesome aims, it can be used for unwholesome aims. And we know, you know, with people we know or with our, our own experience, so we look out in the world, People can use their energy in many different ways. Sometimes people use their energy for the good, and sometimes people use their energy in very harmful ways. So we have to have some discernment and some discrimination. What are we cultivating virya in the service of? And of course here, it's in the service of what is eminently wholesome. That is the purification of our minds, our hearts. But there's a further discernment that's needed. And this is really critical for yogis on the path. And that is even when we're arousing energy, virya, in the service of the wholesome, which we are certainly doing here, We need to investigate and be very sensitive to whether we're applying this energy or using it, wielding it in a skillful way or an unskillful way. 
So this is another whole dimension. Even when it's in the service of the good, how are we using it? And this brings us to the very difficult question, very difficult, uh, almost a problem, of understanding the relationship of virya, of energy, to right effort. You know, when is effort right? When is it balanced? When is it too much? When is it counterproductive? We need to, we need to learn how to monitor how we are practicing, how we're using the energy. You know, in English, the word effort has so many different nuances. A lot of connotations to the English word. So we need to explore the subtleties you know, of, of the meaning of effort and learn how to, how to engage with it in a really skillful way. So effort becomes unskillful, counterproductive, when there is a forcing of the mind. You know, it's what I call efforting. And I think you all have, you know, some sense of what that's like when you're in your practice and you, you're trying to force something to happen and everything gets tense and, and we engage in a struggle. Effort is unskillful when the mind is filled with expectations, when we have an agenda about what's supposed to happen. You know, rather than just an openness and receptivity to what is actually happening. You know, it's unskillful if we're focusing too intensely, when our mind is getting too tight and too uh, narrow, or we're holding on to the object too tightly. And I remember going through one period in my practice you know, where the mindfulness felt pretty strong and even reasonably continuous. But it's like I was walking on eggshells. I had this notion that unless I held on really tightly to each moment, I was going to lose it. That was completely extra and not helpful. So we have to be watching how we're practicing. It's unskillful effort when we're trying to push through some pain or push through some difficulty instead of allowing everything to open and unfold. So when we see this, when we can become aware of the unskillful aspects of virya, of effort that we may be making, we have to notice it and say, oh yeah, this, this is not quite in balance. So at that time, we need to soften, we need to relax, we need to settle back. Recognizing that awareness is always available. We don't have to struggle for it, we don't even have to look for it. It's just remembering to come back, it's always here. So Saida Utejanir, who many of you may know, you know, a wonderful uh, Burmese Saido master. So he talks a lot about skillful effort and what's unskillful. He said, right effort means to keep reminding yourself to be aware. Right effort is persistent effort. It is not energy used to focus hard on something. It is effort which is simply directed at remaining aware. It is not difficult to be aware or mindful. It is difficult to maintain it continuously. So this is an important point. It's not difficult to be aware. It's difficult to remember. It's difficult to keep it in a continuous flow. So that's what the quality of our effort is. It's not a forcing of the mind on the object. It's a relaxing into what's happening in as continuous a way as possible. 
It is difficult to maintain it continuously. For this, you need right effort, which is simply perseverance. So this highlights, you know, just one example of how we need to adjust and pay attention to how we're practicing. On the other hand, if the mind is continually getting lost, <coughs> you know, we're just sitting or walking, moving about, lost in our daydreams, lost in our fantasies, and we're not remembering to be aware. Where we don't have this kind of caring, wise attention, when there's no interest in what's going on in our experience, then we need to arouse more effort. That's when kind of relaxing back even more is not the right strategy. That's when we need to engage more closely and more carefully. At one point I was doing a retreat with Saida Upandita in Nepal and <clears throat> conditions were terrible. There were five of us in a room sleeping on a thin mat on a cement floor. It was right next to the latrine. So all of these smells were coming. To use an American idiom, I was not a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my mind was really grumpy. You know, everything was just so uncomfortable. And <laughs> so uh, I go into side out to give my report and I reported on my state of mind. And he just said, uh, Joseph, be more mindful. And I thought, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Here are these terrible conditions and I'll be more mindful. <laughs> but I so thought I left the interview and okay, this is this great master. I thought, well, <laughs> let me try it. So I'm doing walking meditation and I actually started to practice being more mindful. It's like I started feeling the sensations of the movement more carefully, closer, you know, really becoming one with the movement. And lo and behold, when the mind settled into that more careful, caring attention, there was no room in the mind for all that kind of background grumbling. And it was only when I was practicing, and this is, this is a meditative disease to watch out for, it's, it's what I call more or less mindful. You know, when you're walking or sitting or you're moving about and you're kind of there, you're not totally gone, but you're not really connected. So this, state of more or less mindfulness is precisely when all the defilements can come into the mind. You know, we just start grumbling or whatever it is. And it was amazing. You know, within a few minutes of just being more mindful, feeling things more carefully, more connected, all of that grumpiness disappeared. So it's really that simple. However, we need to be attentive to our mind states, to the quality of effort. You know, when it's too tight, we need to relax, we need to open, we need to soften. If it's too loose, then we need to come in closer. So it's like tuning the strings of a musical instrument. Too tight, we need to loosen a bit. Too loose, we need to tighten it a bit. And what you, I'm sure, already know, it's not a question of, okay, we find exactly the right balance and then we have it. No, just like a musical instrument, it needs continual tuning. So this is an essential part of your work here. And if you bring this kind of attention to your practice, paying attention to the quality of virya, the quality of your effort, then you can make the appropriate adjustments and the practice unfolds in a much more harmonious way.
This is from one of the great Tibetan teachers, uh, Trung, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. It says, there are two shortcomings in practice called lack of attention and being over-attentive. In the former, one does not pay attention to the training and becomes lost in daydreaming. Being over-attentive means to be preoccupied with keeping hold of the meditation to such an extent that it disturbs the peace. The hectic attempt to be so present, so mindful, turns into a distraction all of itself. Of course, one should have presence of mind, but it should be allowed to progress in a spacious way, not in a constricted or rigid manner. The more open the sense of being mindful is, the more at ease it is, the more relaxed we are. This relaxed quality is very important. So in all the traditions, the teaching is exactly the same in this regard. You know, whether it's in the Theravada teachings or the Tibetan teachings, this is the art of meditation. You know, the science of it describes exactly how the practice unfolds with tremendous precision. But the art of it is developing that sensitivity to how we're practicing. As you know, both on retreat and in our lives, we go through many different energy cycles. You know, and sometimes it's many different energy cycles, even in the course of one day. And depending on what's happening within us, keep in mind uh, the range of how virya can manifest. So there are times when we may want to emphasize the heroic, courageous nature. You know, when there's a lot of inspiration and a lot of um, interest, that's the time to actually push the edges, go to the boundaries, you know, of what's comfortable. It may mean uh, deciding to sit longer. You know, the schedule is not, the schedule is just the basic suggested framework, but especially on this long retreat, you're actually encouraged to start to find your own rhythm. So if you're sitting and the bell rings and there's a strong momentum in your practice, uh, continue sitting, you know, sit for an hour and a half, sit for two hours, sit, whatever, just see, see what happens, push that edge. Or you may want to do longer walking periods what would it be like to walk for an hour? To walk for an hour and a half? What happens to the mind? Does the concentration really deepen? Or does it not? The only way to know is if you experiment. Is, so you're playing these edges. It might mean you know, sleeping a little less. It might mean eating a little less. It might be just changing some well-established habit pattern you have just to shake things up a little bit. What's important is that all of these kind of experiments of this more kind of heroic courage, you know, where we're really extending ourselves, that it be done from a place of interest, a place of willingness. It's not about a should. It's not that you should be doing this. It's just if at certain times in your practice you have this interest, so explore, but from a place of interest. On the other side, if it feels too tight, too much efforting, or if the mind is filled with a lot of self-judgment, you know, or ambitious striving, then the softer aspects of virya should be emphasized. Maybe just settling back and relaxing into a very simple, soft continuity of practice. That's what you might be emphasizing. And sometimes experiences can get very intense, too intense, where we lose our balance. We don't have the capacity right, at that particular time to hold what's happening. 
And so at those, those times, it might be necessary to actually pull back from the formal practice some and let the mind come back to a place of balance or of rest. Again, Saito Tejaniya, he, he just expressed this range very well. He said, avoiding difficult situations or running away from them does not usually take much skill or effort. But doing so prevents you from testing your own limits and from growing. The ability to face difficulties can be crucial for your growth. However, if you are faced with a situation in which the difficulties are overwhelming, you should step back for the time being and wait until you have built up enough strength to deal with them skillfully. So we all go through these cycles, you know, and we have to, in our practice, in the art of our practice, is learning to recognize them. And different aspects of virya will be appropriate at different times. It's through the gradual cultivation of this particular awakening factor of virya, of energy, of courage, of perseverance, of persistence, of strength. As we gradually develop and as this particular factor of the heart and mind gets stronger, it begins to inform every aspect of our lives. It's not just about being on retreat. We bring this quality to our lives. The, the 16th Karmapa, and the Karmapa is one of the heads of the great Tibetan lineages. Um, he said, and I think this describes this quality of virya, and he said, we can be living the practice instead of just doing it. You know, and that's the fullness that virya brings to us as we practice it and cultivate it and understand it.